Let's introduce tonight's guest. Joining us, Lieutenant Colonel Sally Stanton. Sally is a retired Air Force Judge Advocate General. She worked as an investigator for the Camden County Prosecutor's Office in New Jersey for five years. She served in the Army National Guard for the military police, and she is currently an adjunct professor at Rutgers University. Also with us, retired Deputy Inspector from the NYPD, Corey Pegues is with us. Corey was in law enforcement for 26 years. He spent 14 years as a combat medic for the U.S. Army and New York National Guard. He's also a former professor and author of the book, Once a Cop, The Street, The Law, Two Worlds, One Man. Great to have you both with us, Lieutenant Colonel and Corey. Um, first story Thanks. tonight comes to us from the Modesto Police Department. They released some video where a suspect is chased through a pharmacy. On you right now? I don't. I don't. Right. No weapons on you? I don't know. I'll patch it down hey, real quick. I gotta, I gotta use the bathroom really bad. Okay, well, you're detained right now. Uh, I'm detained. Relax. I didn't do anything, sir. Hey. Blackmail. Hey, stop, bro. Stop. Get on the ground. Stop! Hey, you better drop the gun, bro. Drop the gun! 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 Drop the gun now. Drop the gun. Linus, come here. Is he inside there? Yeah. Units code three, subject with a gun. People are running out of the store. We need them at the store. Drop the gun now. I got him, I got him. I secured it. Glove up, go on. I don't Somebody have glove up. Glove up. Good enough. Do not move your hands. Okay, are we ready? All right. I'm going to grab him by his feet. I want to drag him this way in the open. You guys okay. ready? Do not reach for nothing. I have no weapons. Do not reach for nothing. I'm going to drag you this way. Okay. On your face. On your face. On your face. On your face. Oh, my God. Tense situation inside that Walgreens. How was, how was this one handled? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, your thoughts? I think they handled it expertly. Uh, the police officer that first had him, he was really good. He was calm. He was patient. When he first saw that gun, he could have immediately shot, and I think it would have been perfectly justified, but he didn't. There were other people in the store. I saw him use the mirrors when the guy went around the corner, which I thought was really good. Uh, also, when they – and you didn't show it in the clip, but I saw earlier uh, when they pulled him and, and they turned him over, he was – you could see he was wounded, not badly. There wasn't a lot of blood, but he was asking for water. He said he was thirsty, and they were they were showing him empathy. They were they were taking care of him, even though they had just he could have taken their life at any second. So I thought they handled this in a textbook manner. Yeah, Corey. You know, I watched this video and I couldn't believe it. I mean, all of us have been inside a Walgreens or a drugstore, and you, I couldn't imagine this happening. It did, and the, and the police. It seemed to me, you know, really showed a level of composure throughout. Well, let, let me tell you, in the wake of what's going on in America, with all of the hate against police and, you know, people spitting venom at police, this video right here should actually be shown to every single graduating police academy around America in the next few months. This, like the judge said, was textbook. I mean, for me personally, the only the only problem I had with this video, and it's really not a, a major problem, is once he approached him, the suspect kept his hands in his pocket. And as being a police officer and working in very violent areas, the first thing I want to see is your palms, never your knuckles, and your hands can't be in, inside of your pants. But other than that, and that's a small thing, but the restraint that he used, nine out of ten cops, I can promise you, they would have shot or let rounds go 
when he fell on the ground and reached to get that gun to pick it up. I mean, I, I don't think that any cop in America can have the restraint that this officer had to keep telling him to put the gun down, even though it only take half of a second for him to turn with that firearm and shoot the officer. Tremendous amount of restraint, but I do think what's going on in America now, cops are, you know, second-guessing themselves or just taking that extra second. I just hope it don't be to the detriment of a police officer. I'm just glad that these cops were able to get out of the situation scot-free. Yeah, Corey, that's such a great point. And Lieutenant Colonel, I mean, that's got to be part of the equation now. If you are an officer and you are, you know, chasing a suspect, you know, in the back of your mind has to be, okay, how is this going to play out? How is this going to look? But you've got to focus on what's happening as well because you want to go home at the end of the day. Absolutely. It's a it's a very scary situation for police officers today. They're they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. And I don't know what was in that police officer's mind, but you have a black suspect and a white officer. And in this case, it worked out to everybody's everybody walked out of there alive. And as as the officer said, you know, this needs to be shown because they showed great restraint. And I hope uh, in the future, this works out as well because you take that half a second to think and he very easily could have shot and we could have had a dead law enforcement officer on our hand. And, and I'm so glad that it worked out the way it did. And, and Corey, the other thing is you're, you're running down aisles here, right? So as I'm looking at that, I'm wondering, do you know who's in the next aisle? Who's in the next aisle when you're discharging that weapon? Uh, I guess you have to take that all into consideration. What direction you're firing in? Who's in the in 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 perhaps the line of fire? You know what's ironic about this video, but I don't know if the audience caught it. But the cop that was chasing him wasn't the officer that fired the round. He and the cop that was chasing him had the clear sight on him at all times, but he didn't think in his mind that he had a justifiable shot. But the other, the backup officer came in, verbally heard his partner saying, "Pick up the weapon, um, drop the weapon." So he had to have faith that in his partner that he did in fact had a weapon. He had a clear line of sight, and he was able to discharge his weapon. But if you really look at this video, the officer that was chasing him going down the aisles, you gotta understand when you're doing this type of work, police work, dealing with violence, a felon, you're locked into that felon. Of course, you don't want to you know, just be shooting all over the, the store sporadically. But he was locked in. And from what I could see, what the judge said, he used the, he used the mirrors in the store. I mean, this cop, this was this was definitely a Herculean effort by this cop to use a tremendous amount of restraint. And uh, I just take my hat off to him. And I wish that we see this much more. But they only so, show the bad things that police officers do. This is a great job by both police officers in this instance. Next story comes to us from KSTU in Salt Lake City. Halloween vandals caught on video. One look at this street. And, you know, like kids love pumpkins. And it's clear the neighbors here take Halloween seriously. Like it's kind of a normal family tradition. We went to the store or to pumpkin place and get out some pumpkins. But outside Esma Gregorio's house, pumpkins have been replaced. Be honest with you, I'm not worried about the pumpkins at all. Like, I'm worried about the hole, the, the huge hole that I have on the window. By a broken window. We was looking at a movie, then we hear it, like a kind of big noise, but we were like, what was that noise? A security camera revealed what made that noise around 2.45 a.m. You can see two guys outside smashing the Gregorio's pumpkins on the ground. Then right before they take off, one pumpkin is thrown right through the front window. Everything in the reading room was full of glass. It was awful. The incident is tough on the parents. It was so scary, I have to tell you. It was so scary. I'm so glad that we wasn't looking at a scary movie because it would be worse. <laughs> and their four kids. I have a three-year-old daughter, and she was like, Mom, what about if they come back and do another thing with the pumpkin? That's why Esma wants to find out who's in this video. They not only broke the window, they broke my calm, like the quiet of my house. So that calm can return. Hear the noise? We are pretty friendly people. We don't have troubles with anybody. We are like... We're trying to do our best. All right, it's not the crime of the century, right? But should police track these kids down and maybe scare them a little bit, um, you know, with the involvement of law enforcement here? Corey, what do you think? 
Oh, absolutely. I think the police should track these kids down. I'm looking at this video. That one kid had very descriptive clothing on. He had on a Puma hoodie, which is something that would, you know, clear. He will wear it again. He had a Justin Bieber type hairstyle. So it's probably neighborhood kids. In my experience, people from three towns away are not committing vandalism in, in you know, different communities. The kids that's there, they should actually pay for the crime. They broke the windows out. You got four young kids there. You know, people work hard to up, tent, you know, to upkeep their homes. There shouldn't be any reason why this is happening. Um, and if you look further on the video, I believe the police officer said uh, earlier when I saw it that, you know, this is something that happens around Halloween, but never to this extent. So hopefully next year they step up some patrols. But I do believe that these kids, if anything, should be able to pay for the crime. Lieutenant Colonel, how do you, how, what would you do if you had these kids in front of you? Well, I agree with Corey 100%. You know, I, I, if I had those kids in front of me, first, I'd like to know, are they just neighborhood kids out around Halloween uh, that they're going to grow up and when they have kids of their own really regret it? Or are they kids that have done this before and they have uh, juvenile records? And I think that would make a very big difference. If this is a first time thing and they were just showing off for each other, you know, they need they need to take care of this and, and pay for the window and apologize to this woman and her children. That little three year old is scared now and this is going to stay with her. But if they if they have a record and they're juvenile delinquents, uh, something more serious should happen. But Corey's right. These are these are easily identifiable kids and they're probably local neighborhood kids. And, yeah, they do need to be scared. Because you want to get them on the right track. This is, you know, typical Halloween stuff. But when it goes to property damage and having very scary things happen that are going to cost money and scare little kids, it's much more than just smashing some pumpkins and toilet papering some trees. All right. When we come back, more crime time plus this. A huge day for 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse as he asks a judge to not send him back to Wisconsin to face murder charges from the Kenosha killings. And 5-0 aren't fooled when comedian Sasha Baron Cohen tries to humiliate them with his Borat routine. We have the video, and tonight, the 13th juror speaks. Go to our Facebook pages and tell us what you think. see a man with gloves on rolling a gurney in a body bag out of a Spring Valley home on August 31st. That body bag was full of stolen items that belonged to a man who was found dead earlier that day. Stealing from the dead. Unbelievable. Another one of the stories we're covering tonight in Crime Time. Still with us, our special guest, Lieutenant Colonel Sally Stanton and Corey Pegues. All right, this one is one of those you scratch your head, you shake your head, you can't believe it. From KGTV in San Diego, the body bag bandit. In this ring video released by the sheriff's department, you see a man with gloves on rolling a gurney in a body bag out of a Spring Valley home on August 31st. Detectives say that body bag was full of stolen items that belonged to a man who was found dead earlier that day. Now in the video, the man then loads everything into a white van. Detectives say that man is Sammy Willie Gates, the owner of Mortuary Transportation Services, a contracted independent mortuary service. According to the sheriff's department, he showed up 11 hours after deputies first responded to a welfare check at the home around noon. A six-year-old man was found dead inside of natural causes, and that man's body was then transported by a different mortuary company. Deputies have not said how Gates would have known the home would be empty. A couple of days later, the sheriff's department was alerted by the victim's family who reported missing items, including a gun, and then discovered the surveillance video. After serving a search warrant on September 9th, detectives found the victim's safe and gun inside of Gates' home, as well as 16 other firearms, many believed to be war relics dating back to the early 1900s. Then detectives found even more, jewelry, watches, war medals, and several thousand dollars in collectible coins. Gates was arrested on September 9th. He he was charged with burglary in the first degree and receiving stolen property. He does have prior felonies and is due back in court for a preliminary hearing in January. Wow. 
Stealing from the dead. Is this a common thing? I, I don't even know. Lieutenant Colonel, is this a common thing? Should I be surprised that people would prey on the dead? Unfortunately, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think you find grave robbing much anymore, but I think especially today with the pandemic and hundreds and hundreds of people dying every day, especially with seniors that may live alone, this guy is probably wired in to the police department. They said a, a patrol car went out and found the body and he's a contractor. So he's probably uh, connected to other local mortuary contractors. He finds out about this. He's got a routine down and I'm sure other people, you know, these, well, when people could go to funerals and stuff, they would have people who would come and have to sit at their houses because people would, they'd leave for a funeral and sadly they'd come home and it wasn't bad enough that their loved one was deceased. They'd come home and their house was burglarized. And now this is just one step further where uh, some poor person who lives alone, their body gets taken away and before their family or loved ones can get to the home, someone like this guy it's just it's so it's disgusting and sad, but he goes and a ransacks a house using his mortuary business as a cover. Unreal. This is like um, I, I, you talk about bad karma. I mean, it's beyond bad karma, Corey, but it seems like you had some inside information. And, and I'm wondering, people gather that information to figure out a way to further victimize someone who has just lost their life. Yeah, and, yeah. let me tell you, I like the judge, she said she think it's happening for, you know, over 25 years. I know that it happens periodically. Uh, this guy's definitely why it, and it, either with the police or the other, um, the company, the other mortuary company that took the body away. They saw some, some items there. They saw a couple of safes. They gave him the information. He probably staked out the location to see if anybody was coming in and out. And at the prime opportunity, you know, criminals are not the sharpest tools in the box. So, you know, they would never get caught. He didn't notice a camera there. If it was a pin camera or, you know, a vivid camera or a ring camera, he didn't see the camera. But I'm pretty sure he did a little stakeout to make sure nobody was going in and out of the location. And then he went in for the kill. But uh, this one, for me, it would probably be really simple. I think the cops probably go up on his phone go up on his phone and see which calls he made that day around the time of the body getting called. And I'm pretty sure his cell phone, you know, the cell phone would have pinged and they could just start the investigation right there. This one is not like rocket science to, to crack. I don't think so. Absolutely. Final story tonight comes to us from the Dallas Police Department working together to save lives. Me and my partner were traveling northbound Jim Miller Road, approaching Syene Road. Uh, it's when we saw a large plume of smoke coming from the intersection. And I remember seeing, you know, smoke in the distance. I mentioned it to my partner and, you know, said, oh, that's something we need to check on. As soon as we came up to the intersection of uh, Syene and Jim Miller, uh, we see a few cars that were damaged due to an accident and a car on fire. And um, I didn't expect anybody to be in there. I just assumed it was a car on fire. And uh, once we got past the intersection, we drove up and, you know, we heard, you know, other citizens saying, you know, there's someone in the car, there's someone in the car. Immediately when we ran up to the vehicle, I looked inside. The car was almost engulfed completely. Um, there was a man inside. He seemed unconscious. I saw my partner go into the car, you know, try and, you know, see if he can help the citizen get out of the car. When I entered the vehicle, the smoke immediately took all vision away. It was pitch black darkness. Um, it was hot like an oven. Uh, the car was melting and dripping onto me and the seatbelt wouldn't come off. So the passenger door we were able to open and we were trying to say, hey buddy, you gotta you know, help us push up so we can pull you out the, drive the passenger door. His foot got stuck. And, you know, we just keep pulling on him, pulling on him. I remember, uh, I believe it was my partner, you know, saying, we gotta get him out, we gotta get him out, he's gonna die if we don't pull him out. And, you know, we just kept pulling and pulling. I mean, at that point, we were just trying to get him out of the car, get him away from everything. Uh, one of the citizens was able to um, get a knife. They cut the seatbelt, and as soon as they cut the seatbelt, it just became so smooth to pull him out. We laid him on the floor, and we saw that he started breathing. So, okay, 
everything is just a bit better now. Now we can focus on, you know, getting the car put out of fire and getting everybody away just in case any, anything uh, else happened. And I told the citizen there, it's like, you know, if it wasn't for y'all, it's like, we, we wouldn't have been able to, to take this on alone. All right, is there a message in this one, Corey? I'm so happy tonight to get these stories where cops are actually doing some really good work. So I want America to know that this stuff is instinctive. Cops do this every single day and we don't hear about this. I just wish the good cops would rat out the bad cops because this is what cops do. No matter what, if there's something going on, cops are going to go there and they're going to do the job. That's 100% of cops, and even bad cops. When they get that call, they're going to go there. And I have a personal experience. This one kind of hits home. It's my partner and I rescued 16 people out of a burning building. And I know that third time going up there was hot. It was hot as hell and I had to scream up to the to the top, please, if anybody up there, you gotta come down right now. It's so hot in these fires. You're talking about them being two to three feet away. I was a floor away from the fire and it was hot. You're talking about a vest, a gun, um, a gun belt, 50 extra pounds on you. Another time okay. that cops put their life on the line. Great. Lieutenant Colonel, is there a message here tonight? Yeah, I think the message is that cops can't do it all by themselves and citizens, they jump in there and they help out when they're needed. Everybody's working on a team, and I think that's great. And it shows that people and cops, they work together for the good. Lieutenant Colonel Sally Stanton, Corey Pegues, great to have you both on the program again. Have a great Thank weekend. You, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.